kind of what we make, what we do, it kind of works for us. So my name is Craig. I'm a head of applications engineering for North and South America now. Uh, for Sennheiser, this is my colleague Brian. Hi, I'm my name is Brian. I'm a product manager and business development manager for Sennheiser and Dear Reality. Yeah. Brian also lives right here too. Oh, yeah, I live in Kent. Go back from his house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so one thing we always want to point out: uh, Sennheiser's been around for a very, very long time. They actually started the company in 1945. When I say we, I don't mean us, but you know somebody started in 1945. <laughs> actually, is uh, Professor Sennheiser. Uh, that is not a picture of him, uh, but they. Basically, after World War II, he kind of cut the, the, the tape on a little farmhouse out in the outskirts of Germany, um, and uh, it's been there ever since. The whole factory is actually built around that original farmhouse. It's like a little museum now, so it's actually pretty really cool. Um, and they've been really striving to be the future of audio since 1945. Uh, we have a brand within the Sennheiser family called Ambio, and this is really all of our technologies that are for immersive audio. So if you see something that says Ambio on it, that's like with a brand name, it goes for a lot of different products, a lot of different categories. Um, but if it has to do with immersive audio in Sennheiser, it goes under the Ambio brand name. So we do things from capture, we obviously make a lot of microphones, but we also own a company, a little company called Neumann, um, if you guys have heard of them as well. Um, and so we do a lot of stuff from Sennheiser and Neumann. We now are working on a lot of mixing and processing through our sister company, Dear VR, that we acquired them a few years ago. Um, so we have a lot of cool software, which we'll show you as well. Um, and then we also do a lot of listening devices from obviously Sennheiser makes headphones, Neumann makes headphones now, and then Neumann also is a premier studio monitor, especially when you're talking about getting into Dolby Atmos mixing and stuff like that. Neumann does a lot of really cool stuff. Um, so the first thing we kind of really want to talk about when we talk about the basics of immersive audio is like, well, what are we talking about when we say immersive audio? You hear a lot of terms, um, and we've kind of, not we, but the, the, um, the industry has come up with this term immersive audio that encompasses a lot, right? So originally you had sound that was in front, right? You had stereo speakers or mono speakers originally, and stereo, and it was in front of you, right? And then at some point in time we said, you know what? We can, we can do more than that. We can create this surround layer. This is where you hear the term surround sound. It's been around for a very, very long time at this point. And that's now all of a sudden, instead of having things just in front of you, you now have stuff maybe on the sides or in the back. You hear about 5.1 or 7.1 systems, and this is surround sound. But now all of this is still within the same listening layer, right? So if you're sitting or standing, everything's still around your head, right? It's all still in the same. And so what we've, we've kind of done as an industry is said, you know what? Let's go beyond just this one plane, and we can add in you know, an additional layer. So whether it's now below you or above you and give you this full 3D representation. So essentially when you hear the term immersive audio, we're talking about there's gonna be audio all around you. It may not be, every system may not have something below or something above. Um, actually above is really where you start to get into it. But as soon as it goes outside of just that layer that goes around your head, it's now no longer surround sound, it's now immersive audio. Um, and there's like a ton of different things that encompass it, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So the first thing it's well, hold on a second. How do we actually hear in 3D? You have two ears, so we probably hear in stereo, right? But no, you, you can hear in full three dimensions, right? If you close your eyes, you can tell something's above you, you can tell something's below you, you can tell something's, you know, far away, close, and it's like, well, how can you do that if you only have two ears? And the reality is, you know, your body has learned the differences in time, the differences in the shape of your face, differences in the, the shape of your ears. And so when a sound comes from above you, it hits the top of your head, which sounds different than if a sound comes below and hits the bottom of your head, right? And your brain over time has learned what that is. We've learned, it's like said, okay, you know what? I know what the top of my head sounds like. I know what the front of my head sounds like. I know what, so if you close your eyes, you can tell if something's coming from the front or the back because you've learned that difference over time. Um, and this is really called something, this is, this is something called a head-related transfer function. And you'll see this HRTF in a lot of places. That's just an acronym for head-related transfer functions. What we've done as an industry is try to come up with a lot of generic versions of this so we can replicate this. Now obviously everybody's head is different. So you've learned your head, you've learned your head, and you've learned your head because that's what we got. Um, but we can kind of replicate this in some sort of a generic way so we can maybe start to get into 3D audio with headphones where you can kind of be isolated in the space, add this information, and get that front, back, top, below information from a head-related transfer function. Uh, so it's very cool and, and really you can hear in full three dimensions because of this. 
Do you want to maybe sure. take us through this? So, and, and what we hope to provide for this lecture too is just a kind of overview of all the different things that you might encounter when people start talking about immersive audio. So we're going to go through a bunch of the different formats and different ways of immersive audio, different types of immersive audio that you'll encounter. And we'll also talk about the different kind of use cases that those, those different formats of immersive audio have been deployed at mostly. However, this is an important distinction to make between different types of immersive content in general. This is a distinction we call the, you know, the difference between three degrees of freedom versus six degrees of freedom, which at its most basic, you can imagine, I mean, these, these are actually pretty good illustrations. You know, in, in a three degrees of freedom experience, I am stationary, I'm fixed on a point. I have no ability to what they call translation within space. I, I can't walk from that center point. In that center point, I can rotate, I can tilt, I can yaw, right? But you don't, you, that's, that's how you have the three degrees of freedom, but you don't have the additional three degrees of X, Y, and Z on the floor. What six degrees of freedom allows us to do is say someone can be in an experience and they can walk around within that experience. They have, in addition to yaw, tilt, and pitch, they also have that additional layer of translation within space. This comes into the kind of delivery formats that you're going to do, the type of audio production that you'll be doing, things that are targeting six degrees of freedom we're going to talk less about today. We, we will talk about some of that, but you know, six degrees of freedom content, you're looking at game engines, you're, you're looking at, you know, um, I don't know, ADM files, different object-based formats, whereas three degrees of freedom, you may more traditionally know as things like TV, you, you know, music, movies, things where you have a fixed perspective, right? Or a relatively fixed perspective. Yeah, like when you watch a movie, it's in Dolby Atmos, you are in one spot and the content creator has created everything around you, right? If you're in a game, you might be here, the bad guy's over there, you can hear him over there. If I move to the other side now, he's on this side. And so you have to render that differently as you go for the different degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the actual different formats that are available. We'll go back and forth kind of going through some of these. But the first thing that you want to talk about is channel-based format. So this is when the format itself is specific to the amount of listening or playback devices that you have. So you know traditionally, this is mono or stereo. You've got one speaker. You have two speakers. It's mono with stereo. And, and all the content is based on that. So if you do. If you're recording a record, which is still almost exclusively done in stereo, we're starting to get into some immersive records, which is really cool. Um, but the most of everything you listen to from you know music is, is going to be in stereo. You either put something in the left speaker, you put something in the right speaker, or somewhere in between those two speakers, and you're playing content through those two. When you start getting up into this surround that we were talking about before, now you're talking about quad, which was around for a little while, a long time ago. Um, for yeah, for a little bit. Um, and honestly, when a lot of these formats come out, including immersive, the first thing that happens always is these really weird and gimmicky, like, you put the drums on the left and the guitar on the right, and it's going to not be a cohesive thing. And then over time, it gets a lot more cohesive. Um, and so it goes into surround sound. You'll see 5171. Those are really common surround. But anything that has speakers that are not just in front of you, that are still in the same plane as your ears, those are, again, surround. And now we get into immersive, which brings you up to a higher level. You'll see these listed as 9-1, 11-1, 13-1, 22.2, and it gets, it gets to be very high numbers. We do try, and we are trying as an industry, to get away from these larger two-digit numbers and get into this three-digit here. Um, and the reason for that is, is 9-1, 5.1.4, or is it 7.1.2? Well, it's both. So how do we know if I say 9-1 what we're actually talking about? And here the distinction is just so we go up, you know, traditionally if you see these channel counts, the first number is always the number of speakers, and the second number is the number of uh, subwoofers you have in the system. And so you can see that pattern repeated here. So this is five speakers in the surround plane, one sub, and four high speakers additionally. Yeah, so we're, yeah, that's what we're essentially doing. We're, we want to split it up now so you know how many speakers are in the surround plane, and how many speakers are in your height plane. And then if you do have speakers below, I think at this point those are actually another digit that's going out. So you could see 7.1.4.2, and that would be seven speakers in the listening, one low frequency channel, uh, four speakers above, and then maybe two speakers below as that. And that's a good distinction. Is this is not how many subwoofers you have. This is how many low frequency right. channels are being sent. So I can have one low frequency channel and put 100 subs, still a dot one, uh, but if I have two different signals that are going for low frequency, like 
you know, this one has these explosions in it, this one has different explosions in it, then that would be a dot two, and you'll see that in a lot of places as well. And, and these are, you know, this is the traditional way that people have done multi-channel or regular audio, thinking about it as speakers, right? You know, in, uh, planning a deployment or creating a piece of content that's targeting a specific speaker arrangement that you can expect people to have, which was the idea of 5171. Now, unfortunately, that never really caught on um, for a number of reasons. Um, there are some benefits to the speaker-based approaches. It's really easy. You can do it pretty much in any kind of software. You don't need anything special. You don't need any kind of rendering or decoding and anything to say, to, to read a file and say, okay, where do I put these sounds in space, right? That's all built in because it's one channel per speaker. However, in the world that we live in today, you aren't going to be able to rely on what speakers people have downstream, right? You know, how many people are watching stuff on their laptops versus their home theater system they have one versus their, you know, whatever. All the different environments in which we consume content today, most of them do not have access in those environments to multi-channel speaker systems. And, and the reality is, well, this is what you're going to see when you're building a channel, a system, right? So if you want to build your home theater or a studio or whatever, you're going to build one of these configurations. You're not going to deliver content in these configurations because you want that content to go to whoever and you have no idea what they have, right? So let's say you do your whole, you're going to, you're going to record an immersive record and I'm going to do the whole thing mixed in 5.1.4 and then you send it to all your customers and some of them have 7.1.4, some of them have 5.1, some of them have stereo. They, they can't listen to it now. They can only listen to like half of what you had or they have speakers that have nothing coming out of them because it doesn't make any sense. So you don't want to necessarily create content in this, but this is the configuration that your customer, uh, you know, whoever's trying to get your content is going to be using. Mm -hmm. So let's go, uh, and this is also why it's not very flexible, but it doesn't require you to have any sort of special rendering in order to use it. You can just, I have 12 tracks, I have 12 speakers, and play one. one. You want to talk a little sure. about object? Yeah, object-based format. So this is this is more when we're talking about three or sorry, six degrees of freedom experiences. So, you know, object-based audio is mostly confined today to the game engine or the 3D engine, you know, whether that be in Unity or Unreal and the associated tools that go along with that wise and FMOD, the audio middle middle middleware for games and 3D experiences. But an object-based format really Whereas channel-based and the other three degrees of freedom ones that we talk about have a designated center, an object-based system doesn't really care where the center is. They're describing an arrangement of objects that are positioned in relation to each other, but you don't have a fixed center, right? So that allows you to be able to describe, you know, to walk up to an object and have it be rendered in real time, right? Or to have the experience of, okay, I'm in a game environment and I hear a sound coming from the computer, you know, I'm using that as a narrative device to bring the listener over here, oh, I can see it gets louder as I get closer, right? These object audio formats allow us to do this kind of flexible rendering based on position and also allow it to be, you know, allow people to move around freely in space. Now, like I said, most of this today happens in game engines, though the audio definition model is an example of that being used for more linear content. Um, but, yeah, so and I would say on the other end, from the speaker-based arrangement, we have the object-based arrangement. And right. so basically the audio is married to the object, mm -hmm. right? And so we're saying, all right, this, and we're in a game and this robot over here has sounds that are associated with it. But we don't know where this is gonna be in relation to the, the user. Mm -hmm. So we have to render that in real time as you're playing the game and say, all right, the, the sounds are baked to this object. And so if I'm in front of it, then it has to be behind me. And if I'm behind it, it has to be in front of me. And if I'm to the left, it needs to be to the right. And and so on and so forth. And so that's what's happening here. And so it takes a lot of processing, um, and now you're baking audio into specific objects that are going to be rendered later during the experience. And this is mostly non-linear, I would say. I mean, you can generally think of object-based formats for non-linear content. I'm not saying there isn't, there isn't linear narrative six degrees of freedom VR, but for the most part, these things are non-linear in you know the traditional sense of the film. Yeah, when he's talking about later, that's what, that's what he's talking about is, is I'm going to watch this movie. I'm not, I'm not creating the experience as I'm going, and the movie could be 50 minutes, could be three hours, could be whatever, because I'm creating that experience. I'm sitting down, and the content creator has said, watch this movie, and, and you go through a specific path, and that's the linear. Mm -hmm. So the next format is your hybrid format, and this is where we really start getting into stuff that you're going to see a lot, and this is really the format that you're going to use for a lot of those channel configurations. 
So good examples are Dolby Atmos, which I'm sure you guys have heard many, many times. Um, there's others like DTSX, MPEG-H. At this point, Dolby has pretty much won this, this war here. Uh, so almost everything is Dolby, Dolby, Dolby at this point. Yeah, um, yeah especially here. Um, and essentially what it's doing is it kind of has this in-between, right? So where you have a bed that goes to a certain amount of speakers, so it could be 5.1.4, 7.1.4, that could be your music that's kind of going to that. And then you have objects that you've married audio to, and those objects live within a three-dimensional space around the user, and then the system itself will render that to the speaker configuration. So essentially, it's think of it as like a sphere, and you've said, all right, this sound is coming from here, and then at the time of playback, the Dolby engine is saying, okay, well, you have this many speakers, so I'll put this object between these ones over here. Or you have a different amount of speakers, so I'll put it somewhere else, right? So let's say the, the sound is on the side, and I only have front and back speakers, it'll put it a little bit in front, a little bit in the back, try to simulate like it's on the side. Right? And so that's kind of what happens is it's rendering that part in real time, but still linear content. Again, now you're only in three degrees of freedom because it's rendering around the user. Um, it doesn't have the ability to detect where the user is and move things based on that. Um, so it's kind of somewhere in between the two formats, and this is what's being used. So if you're going to mix um, you know, uh, uh, an album in immersive, you're going to work on a movie in immersive, you're going to do a, a TV show or, or do sports in immersive, this is what everybody's using now because you can simultaneously send that signal to somebody in their home with a 7.1.4 system and have it do that, but also to somebody with a smaller system, somebody with a stereo system, somebody with a gigantic system, and it'll render it in real time to be right for that particular system at that moment. Or for example, like on your iPhone, if you watch a piece of Netflix content with an appropriate plan and on a new enough device um, with stereo speakers, it'll do transoral rendering, which goes back to this HRTF thing that we were talking about earlier, which will use those two speakers to do the best case it can to give you some sense of space. Uh, from it, or if you're using AirPod, AirPod Max, you know these ones that can do the spatial audio stuff. If you're watching Atmos content on an iPhone, it will render that not for speakers, but using the HRTF that we talked about earlier to create a binaural signal. Yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the formats we're going to talk about here in a second. Sure. Uh, another format that you're going to hear, that you may hear a lot about, especially around VR, especially around kind of three degrees, degrees of freedom VR, is ambisonics. It's a format that was originally invented in the 70s, um, but is a kind of, it's a way of describing a sound field, a scene. Um, so actually maybe the next slide would be a helpful one, if we still have it, yeah. So this is a little bit confusing, but I think this is a fun kind of drawing. So it, this is an Amazonic signal <laughs> um, in growing order. So you can ignore all the different shapes, but you can understand that these are kind of pickup patterns, right? Where where sound is being picked up. But basically what, how an ambisonic signal works is it uses all of these different pickup patterns in order to generate a scene-based description. So ambisonics, unlike the object audio, can, so the, the ambisonics, like object-based audio, can place sounds in arbitrary points in space, right? But unlike the object-based audio, doesn't require that each of those objects itself be individually rendered at playback, right? Which may not seem like that big of a distinction, but say you're developing something for a mobile phone or on a platform with limited compute, audio is traditionally one of those places you get like one compute cycle or 10% of whatever, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and another way to think of it is it's essentially, think of it like a microphone that can pick up full 360 degree sphere around right. the microphone. It's a way of describing that. So it's kind of between an object-based thing, so you can do a lot of the benefits of object-based, but in the end, it's rendered just to audio. All of the differences, you know, these are all audio files. So this is like a super high-order ambisonic signal, and each of these are audio files. So the sound, it, unlike you know Dolby Atmos or the object-based formats where there's metadata, right, like actual text description that tells you where object position is, ambisonics is all audio-based, meaning that Whenever you pan something in ambisonics, it those changes and differences between phase and level and all those kinds of things happen in audio itself. So and this is being done by essentially putting multiple microphones in the same place mm -hmm. at the same time with different pickup patterns in different directions, right? Mm -hmm. And we're then 
layering those on top of each other in order to generate that 360 sphere of sound around this, right? Um, and that's what this is showing you. Uh, when you go to first order, which are just the top four up there, it's literally an omni and four figure eights. That's what you see there at the top. When you get higher and higher, the, uh, the, the pickup patterns get kind of crazy and they don't have any real names to them. Um, but essentially, that's how we're doing it. Now, you can't have four microphones in the same place at the same time. You have them close to each other, but that's no good. You have to have them in the same place at the same time. So what we essentially do is we create a microphone with multiple capsules, record those capsules at the same time, and then after they're recorded, we take that information to create those patterns and layer them on top of each other. And it's so all that, that conversion stuff you don't need to know. Like, you know that it exists, because if you ever deal with ambisonics, you know, you should ask the question, is this an A format or B format? But we only have so much time today, so we're not gonna dive super deep into ambisonics. But just know that this is something that is often used for uh, immersive capture. And you'll see also, these formats are oftentimes interchangeable, right? You know, you can use aspects from one and another. You may record in one, but output in a different format, right? So you should really think of it both, you know, you should have a good understanding of what your delivery format is, and then you can work back from there. And we'll show you some of those tips here. But I think the last one we have is, yeah, static binaural. So this is the least flexible of the options. So ambisonics requires a renderer. The hybrid mode requires a renderer. I guess it's all, almost as inflexible as the multi-channel one. But with the exception of this, it has to be worn on the head, right? You have to be using headphones in order to experience this because we're making some assumptions that these HRTFs this HRTF processing assumes that we have speakers right next to your head, right? Because we're trying to pretend what sounds would be received at your ear if this sound actually existed in space, if that makes sense. And, and yeah. so, so a, a good way to think about it is, if we're gonna add head-related transfer functions to, a, to an audio file in order to trick your brain into thinking the, uh, the audio is coming from the front or the back or the top or whatever, right? We have to take away the real world in order to do that. Because if you're getting your head interacting and then the generic ones that we put on, it's a total mess. So essentially, you gotta wear headphones, so you're now isolated. So the sound is here, and any sound that's coming in from here and here is now away. So your personal head-related transfer functions are gone. You're wearing headphones, so nothing's hitting your face or body or anywhere like that. And now we've created generic ones to tell you, no, no, that object actually was over there. That object was back here. And then your brain is saying, oh, I, I, based on that head-related transfer function, I know that the sound is back here somewhere. Mm -hmm. Great for like scary movies and stuff like that. We watch on headphones, it's like something fine. Right. It's static binaural. The reason why we're breaking this out is distinct. Like the other formats could be decoded to binaural, right? So we're saying these things that require rendering and playback. Could all, most of those, or all of them, could be decoded to binaural. Static binaural here is a, is a really great way to distribute stuff and also record stuff if you know that people are gonna be listening on headphones because it doesn't require any decoding, it doesn't require any special software on the receiving end. You can upload as long as- so just the stereo file. As long as it's a stereo file. So as long as whatever service you're using, you know, I don't know, TikTok, YouTube, all of these things that support you know, stereo, I think. So if, if, all, if, if on these general platforms they support stereo, you can do a static binaural, and you can do 3D audio just wherever you can deliver stereo, under the assumption that people will be using it. And this has been around a really, really long mm -hmm. time, but if you think about it, only in the last few years does everyone have a pair of headphones, yeah. right? Like everybody in this room, you own a pair of headphones, right? You absolutely do. But 10 years ago, did you own a pair of headphones? Did everybody you know own a pair of headphones? Not really. Right? Like, people who are really into music and audio and audio files, they own a pair of headphones. But the general population didn't own a pair of headphones, listening to everything on a pair of headphones, until the last 10 years or so. So all of a sudden, this format says, okay, well, hold on, I can use a binaural mic or an ambisonics mic or something and record three dimension and present it to everybody over all of the generic platforms. Then they just have to put on a pair of headphones and can hear three dimension now instead of just stereo is really come back. Um, and we'll talk about some of the stuff that we make, but we have this guy, this Neumann microphone, it's actually a microphone there. Um, we, uh, that came out in 1992. We sold more in the last year than we have in the last 10 years. And in this case, you can actually see the generic HRTF because the mic is literally a generic HRTF, right? The mic is a generic uh, sculpture of a head, but it is meant to be absorptive like a head. So in this case, when we talk about static binaural, 
a recording static fine neuron, you are printing the HRTF because you're literally, the microphones in this are in the ears of the dummy head. Uh, so. And then we've got this little chart that kind of puts it all together here, right? So you got to think about the, how you're going to be, you know, what your format is, and then what your playback mechanism is going to be. And it kind of gives you a little bit of information here. We can share this with you guys. Uh, but essentially, you know, of course, static binaural can be played back in binaural. That's what it was designed for. Uh, but it does not work for channel-based formats. You don't have any freedom. You can't look around and move around. If you're wearing headphones and I move, everything moves with me, right? So I'm not hearing anything different at that point. Um, but you can absolutely capture this natively. There are microphones like that head that we showed you that capture it that way. When you go to ambisonics, you can render that to binaural. You can render it to channel-based formats, but it doesn't necessarily work really well. So just keep that in mind. Especially in first order. Yep, you have those three degrees of freedom. And when you talk about the orders, as you go up in orders, it goes up in complexity, but also in detail. So that's why you have really high level of detail. You can go to a multi-channel better, but it's super complex to do that. We're not going to go into it today, but it's, it, you know, we teach a few hours just on how to do more than the first order um, at that point. Um, and obviously, there are Amazonics microphones that you can capture straight in Amazonics. Uh, Object-based formats, you can go to binaural. It's really designed for multi-channel, so it's perfect for that. You can get six degrees of freedom. Again, that's your game engine where you're moving around and you're, everything's an object, so no matter where I am, it says, okay, user is here, sound source is there, figure it out in real time. Um, and then, uh, but there's no way to capture that natively. I can't capture all those objects in real time based on where they are, it's not with, with current technology. Hybrid formats can be go to binaural. They are really perfect for multi-channel. Again, this is what Dolby Atmos says, it's designed for multi-channel. Um, you have those three degrees of freedom. And again, because there's objects, there's no way to capture that in real time. Um, so there's no you know, hybrid or, or object-based microphone. It doesn't, doesn't really make sense of the concept. Um, Channel-based formats goes to those specific channels. So it's great for channel. You can definitely capture, if you have 10 channels, you can get 10 microphones and you can capture it directly. Um, but it doesn't really have any other flexibility in this one. Um, so there's no freedom there if I move around. If I'm listening to 10 speakers and I turn around, the audio doesn't do anything different. Well, I guess in that case, it is actually technically three degrees. Because you can move and you have a different audio perspective. Because the speakers are still there, you just look at a different sound. Uh, <laughs> fair enough. So let's talk a little bit about the capture devices that we make, right? There's a bunch of different types of capture devices that you can get. And then even just to take a step back too, when you're thinking about capturing for spatial audio and like mixing for spatial audio, you're not, it's not going to be totally reinventing the wheel, right? It's not a totally different process. You know, all of the same stuff still applies, right? You know, close micing, you know, all the kind of basic mic techniques that you may know or types of sounds you may collect from a set or from a recording, you're still going to be using those kinds of things, including these spot mics, but we'll be adding an additional uh, spatial layer of recording on top of that. Yeah, exactly, right? So when we talk about spot mics, we're really talking about a microphone. Right, a standard microphone, a traditional microphone. Obviously, Sennheiser Neumann makes a lot of really great ones. Those are uh, uh, the 8000 series from Sennheiser. You should definitely check those out. Those are pretty amazing mics. Um, but any condenser microphone or even dynamic microphone that you put on a source, you can then use a panner or render, which we'll talk about a bit, to bring that into the three dimension, three dimensional space, even though it's a single mono sound source. So it's very, very important. Most of your stuff is going to be coming from some sort of spot microphone that you have. You also have multi-channel microphone arrays where you can actually capture you know, multi-channel audio or you know, things like this in real time where you'll put microphones around you know, an object or around an orchestra or whatever um, in these spaces like you have here. So you know, maybe you use different patterns. This is a specific cube that we have. Maybe you want to describe that a little bit. Sure, yeah. I mean, so th this, is a, this is a cube of nine microphones with one the ninth optional one there in the center that was developed originally for capturing um, uh, classical music recordings. But what's interesting about this, and what's interesting about these multi-channel microarrays is that you know it provides you this kind of spacing and gives you this really big sound of whatever it is that you're recording, right? This kind of non-coincident space out. You get this kind of decorrelated noise that's from all over the environment. Um, but uh, these are super helpful for recording for film or for recording the beds for hybrid tracks. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff, and you'll see 
some like really high end orchestral guys that will have, I don't have any pictures of it, but yeah, they'll have like trees of microphones that they put maybe in the center of a mm -hmm. choir or something like that, and they're actually rendering that just straight to different multi channels. Uh, some really amazing stuff that we've heard that comes that way. The next category is going to be ambisonics microphone. I actually have the uh, VR mic up there in the, the center there, and that's actually a first order ambisonics microphone that we make. Um, it's very high quality, but it's not super expensive. We tried to make a microphone that was accessible, but still high quality. So I think they're like 1300 bucks at this point. Um, and there's four capsules inside that all end in different directions. Um, we have a software that we make that can convert it into that three-dimensional thing like we were talking about before, and that's free, that comes with it. And it's really great, especially like in an application like this, you'll see we have one here, uh, we have one up there for the full capture, and then we're also using spot mics on the drums as well, so you're not just using it, we're blending them all together. We did a, um, uh, like an in-studio live kind of thing a few years ago before we all got stuck with all this stuff. Um, and essentially what we did was we spot mic'd all the drums, we had some keyboards, we had some vocals, and then we used a bunch of VR mics, and when we blended those into the headphone mix, because everybody was in the space with headphones, wireless headphones was really cool, it gave this sense of space that you were just completely missing with just the individual spot microphones. Right. Blended together it creates a really cool... Yeah, because overall, you know, what these three mics give you, that the spot mics don't give, and like, the spot mics are intended to capture the close mic sound of whatever you want. No reverb, you want as little reverb as possible, as little external noise as possible, because when you start spatializing that, right, like you start bringing these spot sources in, we'll talk about spatializers, you don't want the noise to be over there also, right, or the reverb to be over there also. You want to have control over reverb so you can create the effects, because reverb, like here, in this space, we can tell where someone is, not only because of the HRTF, but also reverb and those other things. So the overall method is these spatial microphones plus spot mics, with the spot mics meant to highlight you know, particular aspects of a mix or someone's voice or a particular sound effect, but it's always a hybrid. With the spatial mics really capturing acoustic information, you know, the environment, when that's a special thing, right? You know, in the acoustic environment, you want to capture the acoustic environment of a particular church or a particular arrangement or whatever, right? It's where something that can't be done in post-production, but is something maybe inherent in the physical space in the environment. Yeah. yeah. And then there's also binaural microphones, and a lot of times these are used uh, together with a lot of different microphones. So as you can see there, we have some spot mics. We have that binaural mic, which is the head there. We also have a VR mic above it. Um, and this is a really good way to capture straight binaural. Um, th this guy has been used in a lot of really cool situations in the last couple of years. Uh, NPR has been using it for the tiny desk, and they have one actually like above the tiny desk. A lot of orchestral stuff. Uh, that's probably the best binaural microphone you can buy by a long shot. It's also probably the most expensive. I think there are ten thousand. Oh no, it recently dropped the price this year. Know, eight thousand dollars. Eight or nine grand. Yeah. Point, so <laughs> definitely not something you just get a few of and throw them in the backpack, but. Um, but they're very, very high quality, and you can really, when you record something with that and listen back to it on headphones, it is very close to what you experienced while you were in that space, right? So again, if you, if you had that head sitting here, and you were standing here listening to the concert, the, the whatever you have in front of you as a source, and then you listen to this recording on a pair of good headphones, and it's gonna be super, super close to what that is, which really gives you that real experience of being in that environment. So another thing that's really important that Sennheiser and Neumann do a lot on is monitor. Um, and obviously we have a lot of really good headphones. Uh, Neumann has a new pair of headphones that came out recently called the NDH20s, as you see seeing here. Uh, those are absolutely amazing studio headphones. Um, and then Sennheiser has a very, very long history of professional headphones as well. Um, everything from you know, inexpensive HD200, HD280s, which are 100 bucks or less, um, all the way up to uh, HD 800, which are $2,500 headphones. Um, and then, in addition to that, there's a lot of software that we're now working on from our dear reality company um, that kind of gives you that. Maybe, Brian, you want to talk a little bit about what that monitoring yeah. software can do? Sure, and just about monitoring in general, because, you know, in all of those formats, they either expect a particular type of output, right, like headphones or multi-channel, or they have to be rendered, right? So, for most of these immersive formats, there's some kind of monitoring stage. You have to pay attention to monitoring. And so we're not going to go into all the details because this is only an hour-long class, but it's whatever format you pick, you have to make sure that your entire chain, including monitoring, supports that because you won't be able to use your normal monitoring chain. What we're showing here is our software called DRVR Monitor. 
This is a kind of multi-channel speaker environment simulator. Um, really, we've seen it used in you know, live broadcasting now that people are doing more remote work. Um, uh, and in other environments where people don't have access to a multi-channel speaker system but still want to mix Dolby Atmos, or they want to mix 5.1 in an environment where they only have a pair of headphones. So really what, what the software that we make allows you to do is take any kind of speaker arrangement that you could want to plug into it, either as the output of the Dolby Atmos renderer or the output of whatever thing upstream, and you can have the same experience of being in a mixed room and having all having access to the multi-channel speaker system without actually having a multi-channel speaker system. And up until now, that, that's exactly what was going on. So if you wanted to work on Dolby Atmos or you wanted to work on a, a movie or you wanted to work on um, you know, anything that was channel-based, you, you had to have that system. How am I supposed to work on 7.1.4 uh, mix if I don't have 12 speakers? Like, how are you supposed to do it? And so now what we've done is we've come up with a way to, with those head-related transfer functions that we talked about earlier, uh, you know, create that virtually inside of a pair of headphones. So it essentially brings the, all the tracks. You're still working on your Dolby Atmos mix, so you're not going down to a stereo mix, you're still working on that. And then this software is saying, okay, I'm gonna put them in where the speaker should be and then render that in binaural using the HRTFs to a pair of headphones. So you can pop them on and kind of get where those speakers are supposed to be. Um, it's a really great, especially if you work in like a studio where you're doing the big mix on the speaker system and then you gotta go home and do some edits. You know, like here, for example, if you only have one immersive room, and there will be more people doing immersive. Apple Music is now doing this big immersive push. Netflix is doing all of their main original productions in, in Atmos. Immersive audio is not going away. It's going to leapfrog in ways that 5171 was never possible for, just because of the flexibility. Well, the sound bars, right? I mean, sound bars today can do Atmos in a way that's pretty acceptable, depending on the price of the sound bar. And that's going to bring Atmos into way more people's houses than ever had 5.1 or 7.1. So all of the major broadcasters and all of the major content companies, you know, Netflix, Warner, all of these people, are all moving, shifting resources into to building immersive and, and we think that the reason that this is really taking off versus the previous stuff that kind of did but didn't is because of its flexibility, right? Mm -hmm. So when 5.1 and 7.1 came out, you know, if you wanted to experience that, well, the, the movie studio had to do a separate mix in 5.1, do a separate mix in 7.1. They had to provide that content. So now when you bought a movie on DVD or Blu-ray, all of a sudden it was, there's a stereo mix, and there's a 5.1 mix, and there's a 7.1 mix. And the studio had to make all of those separately. You had to do it three times in order to make that happen. And then it says, okay, well, this is a stereo system, so we'll play the stereo mix. This is a 5.1 system, we'll play the 5.1 mix. Now you can do it once in Dolby Atmos, and then the Dolby Atmos system says, okay, well, I'm a free-floating object, so this system's stereo, so I'll move it over here. Oh, this system's 7.1, so I'll put it over here. Oh, this system is a 5.1.4, so I'll put it over there. So now the studio says, well, wait a minute. I can now provide content in a lot more places, right? I can um, you know, pro provide this really high-level experience for the customers that have that for the theaters, for the people who have these huge systems at home, but I only have to do the one mix, and the guy who still just has the TV with the stereo speakers in it, yeah, it's gonna work perfectly for them? And the answer is yes, it will. So there's a lot of really cool stuff that's going on there, and it's making it a lot more flexible and a lot easier, and so it's really taking over. This is really why Dolby was able to kind of, yeah. you know, everything's Dolby Atmos. And in the last year or two, we've seen the major companies kind of jump onto the Dolby Atmos wagon, and now it's, that's what it is. As soon as, Samsung and Apple and Netflix say, all right, Dolby Atmos, it's over. They, everybody else either does that or doesn't do anything, right? That's, that's what's happening. So in addition to doing that, obviously we have the speaker systems that you can, that you can get as well. So Neumann makes a full line of studio monitors. Um, they're really uh, absolutely amazing for immersive audio. Uh, I actually have uh, these speakers here as the height channels now in um, uh, Skywalker, which is where I'm like, Tons of the all Star Wars stuff is mixed there out in California. Also, Michael Romanowski is using those as his height channels as well. And the really cool part about that, so these are not super inexpensive speakers, but they're not very expensive either. These retail around $2,200, right? So they're not crazy. But both of those rooms that I just mentioned, their standard plane speakers are in the half a million plus dollar range, 
right? So they really hang with some really amazing and very expensive systems. Um, and the accuracy, especially for when you're doing multi-channel, is really there. So just to give you a really quick overview, uh, we make them in four different sizes for the top speakers. There's the 80s, which are about 500 bucks a piece. There are the 120s, which are $750 a piece. We make these 310s, which are about 2200 2, And then we make some really large formats that are about this size. I don't know what those are, but about that size, which are around $5,000 a piece. We make a few subwoofers that complement with that. Um, and the new speakers that we've been coming out with, which is the little ones that just came out a couple years ago, have full DSP functionality in them now. So you get full uh, parametric EQ and time delay and all sorts of stuff that you can do, and also room tuning now that we have. So there's some really cool stuff that's happening with those speakers. Um, <coughs> they're, pretty, they're pretty amazing for what they are. And they really lend themselves to all of these different channel-based formats uh, because of how transparent they are. The other thing that's really cool is you can use different size speakers in the same space because the sound from one to another is, is very, very transparent. Obviously, with a bigger speaker, you're going to get more low frequency. You'll get a little bit more separation of the mid-range because you have a separate mid-range driver. But you can use a smaller speaker as a high channel and because they're so transparent. They blend perfectly together. So that's really what they're going for with the speakers: is transparency and all of the different sizes being equal in terms of sound quality. But you can also see how there is also demand <laughs> for people to mix without speakers, right? I mean, I, how many people have enough space to install a 514 system in their house? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot. There's a lot of different options there. Yeah. And there's a lot of cool stuff. And that kind of brings us into the software that we do as well. Um, and this is just a listing of some different stuff that we have here. Um, but what we'd love to do is show you some of the software that we actually have. Um, and so on this laptop, I've got, uh, we have the three, three different software for our gear reality uh, subsidiary. So we have the monitor software, which is that monitor, you know, we're able to take the Dolby Atmos mix and uh, render into a pair of headphones and do that uh, virtual multi channel. We have, um, took away my picture. Oh, sorry. That's, that's okay. We have the Pro software, which is our renderer, painter, <coughs> virtualizer. She does a whole lot of stuff. Um, so that software is basically you can put it on a track. You can decide where you want to go. So I want to go to 5.1. I want to go to 5.1.4. I want to go to Amazonics. I want to go to whatever. And then you have a panner in there, which we're going to show you in a second, that will allow you to take that spot mic, that object that you recorded, and pan it into the three-dimensional space. Uh, there's also some really cool uh, multi-dimensional um, reverb in there as well. And then you actually have some renderers too, so you can kind of monitor it pretty easily. And then the last software that we're hoping to show you if this headset is working. Yeah, the headset's not working, but we'll, I, we can at least give this the, this demo and then I can talk about the other one. Yeah, we, and we can show what it is, is we actually said, well, you know what? What's the hardest thing about mixing when you're doing something for virtual reality, like what, what's the hardest thing? So what's happening is, before this software, you would go into the VR and say, okay, I'm in this space, and there's a mountain over here, and there's a robot over there, this thing over there. And then you come, you take off the headset, and you say, all right, so I think that let's pan the robot this way, and the spaceship I think was over there, and then the, the, this was here. And you put back on the headset and the headphones, and you're like, oh no, the, the, the mountain is talking now. That's not good. Then we need to switch that, right? And then you go back in the headset, and okay, and then you start mixing, and, and it's a crazy long process. <coughs> and so what we said was, well, what if we could take the DAW and overlay it into virtual reality? <coughs> Sorry. And then make a software where you can go in the VR and start mixing inside VR. So their homework this weekend? is to watch a video from uh, Adam Savage's sound mixer from Mythbusters, who mixes all in VR and shows how to move things around and where the hammer's going to go. And all that <coughs> stuff. What's, what, what programs did he use to mix? Uh, good question. They have their own, they were working with some company doing some trial software. Huh, I wonder. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, just to show people some things. Uh, so what I have going here is probably, well, now Logic, you can do it in Logic too. But if you're more video people, the cheapest way probably to get into Atmos at the moment is with uh, a DAW called New Window. Um, That's what he was using. Huh? That's what he was using. New Window. OK. Yeah, so, so New Window costs about 1000 uh, bucks. If you want a similar functionality from Pro Tools, it costs I'm using this one. It, it, it costs 1000 bucks a year. Um, but just to say, you know, most all the major DAWs support 
you know, uh, Dolby Atmos production. But what I'm showing you here is a full Dolby Atmos session. Um, you can see, you know, we have uh, Dolby Atmos object panners here. Uh, this is kind of what we're talking about, about spatializing objects. So this is an example, not made by us, but I'll, I'll show you one made by us in a second. So this is passing, this, is, this object exists exactly in the center, right? But I could move this object anywhere around the center listening plane, and this would then encode that information, oops, sorry, uh, encode that information into the Dolby Atmos encoder, which is a box listening to the output of the metadata from that. But at the same time, if you want to, let me just find, Right. Oops. <clears throat> Sorry. I think it should be. Sorry. This track that is really good. Time. So, this is Dubiar Pro, which is another panner. And actually, in the window, you can just even fully replace the existing panner with with this one. So this is the one that we made. And you're going to need some kind of panner, right? You know, in the stereo world, you have a panner built into the DAW. You go left, right, or in Premiere, whatever. You go left, right, you mix whatever you need. When you start mixing for Atmos, or you start mixing for Immersive, you're going to need to be able to generate either these higher channel-based numbers, right, 514, or, you know, 712, whatever, or generate ambisonics or binaural. The cool thing about this tool that we have um, is that, you know, in addition to the basic panning, right, which you can do is simply just as drawing the position around space, we also have additional effects like reverb, which is a shared reverb between all of the objects that use it. So you get this shared sense of space, as well as what we call early reflections. Um, so early reflections, like I was saying earlier, it's like we get a lot of cues, sorry about clapping, but we get a lot of cues about where sounds are coming from, not only from the HRTF, but also with how our voice interacts with the space that we're in or how the sound interacts with the space that we're in. So reflections allows you to turn on those extra cues. So these are extra cues and effects that you can use to kind of improve the kind of performance or make it more kind of hyper-realistic, you know, to get the kind of desired effect. Um, and the cool thing also, finally, about Pro is if you mix something in this, you can output it to all the different immersive formats, pretty much. You know, all the ones we listed before, all the different speaker arrangements, you know, basically you can do mix once and deploy anywhere. Um, all the way up to third order ambisonics and 16.6 or whatever. Some kind of crazy, some number that no one really uses, uh, but it's on the spreadsheet. So, so this is this. And then just to show you also a Dear VR monitor, which is that, that uh, rendering plugin that we're talking about. This thing, oops, this thing here is just sitting on the master bus. So it's taking, it's taking the output from the Dolby renderer. So like, I, like we were talking, Dolby Atmos is a hybrid format. So when you're mixing in the DAW, in the digital audio workstation, you're mixing objects and you're sending beds all to the Dolby Atmos renderer, which is then saying, okay, what kind of speaker or system do you have in your studio? And you tell it, okay, I have a 514, maybe normally you do have a 514 system in your studio, but right now you're out in the go, you can drop this plug-in right on the master bus and then listen to your Atmos mix. Or if you don't have a speaker system at all, you can use this from the get-go and just mix completely on this. It's essentially tricking the DAW into thinking you have this feature. Yeah, and then rendering it. And, and there are some other tools on the market that will render virtual studios that are tied to like specific studios, right? Like Abbey Road or, you know, whatever. Like these famous studios. And to be honest, that's not actually what you want in a lot of ways because those all those famous studios have imperfections, right? So, and there, there are ways that those studios work around it and, you know, they learn in the space. Right. And, and an imperfection in a mic, you know, we call that warmth or whatever, right? You know, that's something that we like. It, it, an imperfection in a room just makes it harder for your mix to translate to other rooms, right? So instead of taking the approach here where we measure like a fancy studio that's famous, we've actually just, you know, taken a blank sheet of paper and said, what are the best acoustic conditions to mix in? And then recreated those in the program instead of trying to recreate an imperfect room. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those are the cool things. What, what we really wanted to show you is also this tool called Dear VR Spatial Connect, which unfortunately my Oculus is throwing a fit. Let me see, one more time. But what this allows you to do is all of those, those panners that, that we have, both the Atmos panners, the ones that aren't made by Dear Reality, but also uh, the Dear VR Pro panners, um, you can control all of those objects. We can see all of those objects in 3D space and be able to control them instead of, you know, 
like here, we, I can show you, oops, like this one here, right? We're, if you're dealing with a ton of objects and you're trying to drag that and like, like track a person, that sounds really hard. It is really hard, I can tell you from experience. But instead what you can do is by wearing a headset, you can just point at an object, you know, you can change your automation mode and then just follow a person around and now your object is following that person. So is that basically making a bunch of keyframes then? Um, you can, well, we don't, can you do keyframes? In automation mode, we, we call it different things in audio, I think, right? You yeah. have a keyframe, you can touch it. I always, I, I have to look those up. You're basically time. spatially tracking. Them. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. You can do that. A keyframe, I guess, when I, when I hear keyframe, I say, okay, we pick three points. I pick the position of those three points, and then it interpolates. Yeah. Um, I think you can do that in digital audio workstation. That might be called touch. I forget. Yeah. There's like, there's different automation modes in, in audio. But it's something you just do in real time, so you yeah. can actually drag it yeah. across. Yeah. And, then see it. and it's also helpful, too, because you can mute or you know whatever so like a big problem too if you're, you're if you're troubleshooting a spatial audio mix regardless if it's for vr or if it's for a traditional film if you have a ton of objects that are blowing around your head what we'll give one more try yeah if you have a ton of objects blowing around your head and you, you hear a problem sound it's one thing to go through and try to figure out what sound that is that's coming from over there but if i'm in headset i can see this object, we, we, we render them as kind of uh, balls. And you can see this ball and just reach over to it and see what channel it is, adjust the volume, even move it. So you can do all this kind of thing that like is you know, cognitively hard to do in two dimensions, right? Because if your face, you know, you're working in three dimensions, but you have to represent that in 2D on a computer screen. So by stepping into 3D, you can make the whole mixing process simpler and easier. So in your software, are you seeing the actual physical video, or are you just seeing representations? It, it? it depends. So if it's a 360 video, like you're making a VR film, you can load the 360 video directly into the headset, and then you can mix directly in your 360 video. Um, if you're making for a feature film, we have like virtual environments, you can put into a fake theater or a fake living room, and then do the same kind of mixing. Um, we're also working on the similar equivalent. Um, this, this is, we haven't announced this yet, so. But uh, we are working on it also for, for object-based stuff, working in game engine. So you can imagine similar types of problems, right? People do complex sound designs for VR games. They get into the headset, they're like, ah, oh, man, that you know, bird over there sounds like crap. I have to like, which bird is it? How, why does it sound like crap? Which audio sample is it? Like, or what adjustments do I need to make? That's something that requires people to go in and out of headset, right? But if you're mixing in headset, you don't have to make that, that kind of back and forth. That might actually be the issue. No, but I tried that. I don't know. Blame marks out a bit. Yeah, right. <laughs> so we'll see if we can get that up just to show you guys. But um, while he's working on it, do you guys have any questions? Because that's what we were going to, that's everything we have kind of to show. So happy to answer any questions you might have about any of the formats. Any